Now the book is uh, entitled Permanent Revolution in, L in Latin America, but then it has a subtitle which says Cuba, Nicaragua and Venezuela. When uh, John originally proposed this uh, book, this book was to cover much wider scope and, and we had an idea of having uh, chapters or dealing with permanent revolution in other countries where it is important and they have an important uh, history of revolutionary struggle in which the theory of permanent revolution played an important role, for instance Bolivia and, and others. But in the end, as the different chapters were growing in size and number of pages, we had to limit ourselves to these three countries, which I think uh, are relevant for the continent as a whole. And they also uh, provide very good examples and indications of uh, a positive confirmation of the permanent revolution and a negative confirmation of uh, the, 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 the permanent uh, revolution. Now, first question we need to answer, we need to ask ourselves is what is the theory of permanent revolution? The theory of permanent revolution was first uh, explained by Trotsky uh, in his conclusions from the 1905 revolution in, uh, in Russia. And uh, then it was systematized or crystallized in, in the form of a proper theory in the early 1920s in debates in the, in the Soviet uh, Union between Trotsky and the Stalinists who were inventing uh, an attack against uh, Trotsky on this question of the permanent uh, revolution. And that, that's when Trotsky wrote the book, Permanent Revolution, which we advise everyone to, to read. But if you want to know the, um, the, the, the center or w w the, the real meaning of, of permanent revolution, th this can be explained in this uh, quote from uh, Trotsky, where he says in his uh, thesis on permanent revolution at the end of the book, he says, with regard to countries of of a, with a belated bourgeois development, especially the colonial and semi-colonial countries, the theory of the permanent revolution signifies that the complete and genuine solution of their tasks of achieving democracy and national uh, emancipation is conceivable only through the dictatorship of the proletariat as the leader of the subjugated nation above, it, above all of its peasant uh, masses. So basically saying that in countries which arrived late to the capitalist uh, development, that uh, capitalism was developed when imperialism was already dominating the, the world, even though in some of these countries, national and democratic tasks, i.e. the tasks of the bourgeois revolution, are still pending in one degree or another, this cannot be carried out by the national bourgeois. The national bourgeois, by virtue of having arrived late at the scene of history, is now linked and tied by a thousand threats to imperialism, uh, to the landowners, and therefore no genuine progress on the national and democratic revolution can take place, neither on the question of agrarian reform or genuine national independence, genuine struggle against imperialism, if these revolutions are led by the, by the bourgeois class in these uh, countries. Not only this, he also says that therefore this task now falls onto the shoulders of the working class. However small in numbers it might be in these countries, but remember that in Russia, in the, the 1917, the working class was also very small in uh, numbers. Uh, it is the working class, the only class in this type of countries that can carry out these uh, tasks by taking power in its own hands. Not only this, but once having taken uh, power, it will the, the, this class will not stop uh, purely at the national democratic demands, but uh, it will start to infringe onto bourgeois property rights. It will start to uh, move in the direction against uh, capitalism. And, and the theory of permanent revolution also says that these tasks cannot be fully completed on the national arena, but have to be linked with the international revolution. This is a very summarized uh, explanation of what the theory of permanent revolution uh, means. Now, uh, in the book, we argue that this applies to Latin America completely. No, not only today, still applies today, but it applies in uh, Latin America for the last 100 or 200 years.
since these countries uh, won uh, uh, independence. That is, that the, the national bourgeois was too <coughs> backward, too linked with uh, imperialism, too linked with uh, uh, the landowners to carry out uh, any genuine progressive uh, role or to carry out uh, any genuine uh, national uh, liberation and, de and democratic uh, struggle. Now, uh, as we know, <coughs> as I said just a minute ago, thi this theory was then uh, contested by the Stalinists, <coughs> who uh, in reality recovered the Menshevik theory of two stages uh, and, and made it their theory. And they implemented it throughout the Communist International in the mid to, to the late 1920s. And this had an impact also in, uh, in uh, Latin America. The two-stage theory uh, of revolution in backward countries means that uh, because the main tasks in these countries are national democratic or bourgeois tasks, therefore the leadership of the revolution should fall on the shoulders of the bourgeois or the progressive sections of the bourgeois liberals in these uh, countries and, uh, and the working class should play an auxiliary uh, role. And only later, after a period of capitalist, genuine capitalist development, will the tasks of the socialist revolution be uh, posed. This is not just a theory which had been disproven by the experience of 1917 in uh, Russia, but it's also a theory that led to major disasters for the working class revolutionary movement in a series of uh, countries, chiefly in uh, China in the, 19, uh, in the 1920s. Now, L Latin America, um, there's been uh, always a big debate about the character of the socio-economic formation of Latin America under the Spanish colonization and later after independence uh, in the 19th uh, century. There are some, particularly Stalinist uh, authors, who argue that uh, Latin America was feudal in its socio-economic formation. No, not only w it was feudal under the Spanish colony, but it was feudal all the way up to whatever, the 1950s, the 1960s, the 1970s, or that there, there was still a semi-feudal regime in many of these countries. And from this, they drew the conclusion that therefore the, the, the revolution had to be an anti-feudal or anti-oligarchic uh, revolution as separate from, uh, from a socialist uh, revolution in a completely different uh, uh, stage. Now, this is, this is not the case. Uh, if you actually look, uh, even under the Spanish uh, colony, uh, the situation in Latin America was very particular because it is true that uh, in the in, uh, 1500s Spain was a feudal uh, country, but a feudal country in which the, feud the feudal institutions were already very weakened. But, uh, and, and obviously this country is the country that colonized uh, Latin America. The socio-economic formation in Latin America was never really feudal in the strict sense of the, of the word because this was large uh, plantations, large uh, states, uh, mines, and so on, which were not producing for, for their own uh, limits. They were producing for the world market, which started to, to arise at that uh, time. And uh, in fact, they were not even, uh, they were integrated in a world system <coughs> which was starting to set the basis for the primitive accumulation of uh, capital. And, and as Marx explained, uh, the expoliation of Latin America played an important role in the primitive accumulation of uh, capital. So even at that time, uh, Latin America was not really feudal as uh, such. Feudal economy is basically a closed economy within the, the constraints of the domains of, of, a, of a feudal uh, lord. Uh, and that's not the that was not the case in Latin America. But clearly, after 1810, 1820s, when the, the main countries in Latin America achieved their independence, uh, the, the new socio-economic formations were extremely dependent on imperialism extremely dependent on, im on uh, imperialism, first uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, British and to a certain uh, degree American US uh, imperialism, but uh, then mainly uh, dependent on US uh, imperialism. But you couldn't say that, this, uh, that the, form the socioeconomic formation was uh, feudal uh, at all. You had at the top of these societies uh, 
a very reactionary block of different uh, classes that united the industrialists, which, which did <coughs> exist in, in, a, in a nation form at that time, the landowners, which were mainly producing for a capitalist uh, market, and the bankers, so that uh, the landowners had the money deposited in the banks, the banks had investment in the land, the industrialists had the investments in the, in the, in the land as well. So it was uh, w what we sometimes call an oligarchy, uh, uh, a block of different uh, classes and uh, this this block was completely linked and dependent on imperialism uh, through many different uh, ways but mainly through the domination of the world uh, market and their inability of creating a nas national uh, economy national internal uh, market uh, and what what best describes this socio-economic formation is not feudalism or semi-feudalism but uh, capitalism in conditions of combined and uneven uh, development, which is what Trotsky described uh, uh, the Soviet, the, the Russia before the revolution as uh, being. Uh, and this is the best way to understand Latin America from a Marxist uh, point of view. Yes, there were remains of previous uh, social formations. In some cases, the Spanish colony was grafted on top of uh, the Asiatic mode of production of the Inca, Inca Empire and so on but nevertheless the the the, the dominant uh, feature was one of the de dependency on the on imperialism and imperialism is clearly a feature of of uh, advanced capital capitalism not, not a feature of uh, feudalism so that is what uh, in in our opinion makes it uh, the, the the theory of permanent revolution is completely applicable to uh, uh, latin america in fact the first Latin American uh, Marxists in the 1920s, even though they were not aware of Trotsky's permanent uh, revolution, they adopted the same strategy or one that was very, very close. For instance, uh, Mariategui, Sir Carlos Mariategui, who was the founder <coughs> of the Peruvian uh, Socialist uh, Party, which was in effect a communist party, also the founder of the Peruvian Trade Union Confederation, uh, and a major figure in Latin American uh, Marxism. He had uh, some shortcomings. He didn't really understand some of the international debates that were going on in the, in the communist movement at that time. But in relation to uh, Peru, he had a very sharp understanding, which was uh, exactly the same as Trotsky's permanent revolution. He said, for instance, in his uh, famous uh, seven essays on, on uh, Peru, uh, on the economic formation of Peru, he said, there is uh, in Peru there is not and there has never been a progressive bourgeois. Only the, on the, only the action of the proletariat can stimulate first and realize later the tasks of the democratic bourgeois revolution, which the bourgeois regime is incompetent to develop or fulfill. And once fulfilled these democratic bourgeois tasks, the revolution becomes in its aims and in its doctrine a proletarian uh, revolution. The revolution in Latin America will be nothing more, nothing less than one stage, one phase in the world revolution. It will be simply and purely a socialist revolution. I think it's quite clear. And I'm stressing this point because Mariategui has been completely distorted uh, by everyone, by reformists, by Stalinists and so on. And, and they have tried to present Mariategui as someone who somehow invented a new type of Latin American uh, Marxism. And this is <coughs> not correct. He was just applying Marxist theory to the concrete conditions of, uh, of Peru. Uh, Julio Antonio Mella, the founder of the, of the Cuban uh, Communist Party and a very important figure in the revolutionary movement in uh, Cuba, who was also the founder of the Students' Federation in uh, Cuba, he also had the same, uh, the same approach. And he said, in its struggle against imperialism, the foreign thief, the bourgeois, the local thieves, unite to the proletariat to use it as cannon fodder. But the, in the end, they understand that it is better to ally themselves with imperialism, which at the end of the day pursue a similar interest, and from progressive they become reactionary. The concessions which they used to make to proletariat in order to have it to its side, 
a betrayed once this in its advance becomes a danger both for the foreign thief as well as for the national thief. And here they start to shout and scream against communism. To speak concretely, na the full national liberation can only be obtained by the proletariat and it will carry it out, it will be uh, uh, achieved through workers' revolution. So he was also very clear in his uh, position. And I'm stressing this because then when the communist international degenerated in a Stalinist uh, way and the two-stage theory was uh, promoted and adopted through, uh, imposed really throughout uh, the communist parties, including in Latin America, uh, to the opposition of many of these uh, people, for instance, Mariategui was supposed to go to the 1929 conference of communist parties in Argentina, and he was uh, he'd written a thesis which was against the two-stage theory. He, he was unable to attend in the end, and uh, the leader of the, of the Latin American uh, Stalinist, Vittorio Codovilla, basically destroyed that thesis and it was voted uh, down and the two-stage theory was imposed. Two, two disastrous effects. We had later on, particularly in the, mm, also in the 1930s, but particularly in the 1940s, in the context of the Second World War, which according to Stalinism was a war between democracy and fascism, you had the communist parties in Latin America supporting democracy in the form of the right-wing reactionary dictatorships in, the, in those countries, which just happened to be on the side of the United States during the, during the Second World War. So in effect, these communist parties ended up supporting uh, US imperialist interests in their own countries. For instance, in uh, Nicaragua, where the communist party supported uh, Somoza in 1944, in Cuba, where the Communist Party joined the Batista government in 1942 with two uh, ministers. In Argentina, where in 1946 the Communist Party supported the candidate proposed, uh, the, the bourgeois candidate proposed by the US uh, embassy against uh, Perón in the 1946 <coughs> uh, election, just to give some, uh, some examples. This was a complete uh, disaster. In, in, uh, in general. Now, as I said, the book deals mainly with three revolutions, the Cuban Revolution, the Nicaraguan Revolution, and the Venezuelan uh, Revolution. The, the Cuban Revolution is a very good example of uh, permanent uh, revolution. Cuba was the last country in uh, the Spanish uh, America to achieve its independence. And by, because of this reason, when it achieved independence at the end uh, in, in 1898, it already had a developed working class. And, and this made the Cuban uh, bourgeoisie more reactionary even than others in, uh, in the continent, though only as a matter of degree. But uh, because they were, very, they were very afraid of the, the revolutionary potential of this uh, working class, if they were to mobilize the masses in any in any serious way against imperialism, they will be mobilizing the working class, which was a threat to their own uh, interests. Uh, and so from the very beginning of the national liberation struggle in Cuba, the, the, na the national question and the social question became very, very closely linked. Uh, you can see that even in uh, 1868, when, when the beginning of the, of the war for independence, when Manuel de Céspedes uh, issued his first call for a revolutionary war, he was, uh, he was a landowner and a slave owner. And the first thing he did was he liberated his own slaves. Uh, and, and he therefore linked clearly the, the, the cause of the liberation, uh, the, the struggle against uh, slavery with the cause uh, of the struggle against national uh, uh, slavery. Uh, then later on, for instance, uh, Martí, uh, at the end of the 19th uh, century, José Martí, one of the main leaders of the struggle for independence, when he set up his revolutionary Cuban party, his main base of support was amongst the cigar uh, workers, both in Cuba and also in Florida, where there was a large uh, uh, colony of Cuban, uh, of Cuban uh, workers. So uh, you can see that the two things became very closely uh, uh, linked. Um, that, that can also be seen, for instance, in the 1933 uh, revolution, uh, the 1933 revolution, which also uh, showed 
the, the treacherous role of the communist, uh, of the communist uh, party, uh, which first advocated an alliance with uh, bourgeois and then shifted towards an ultra-left uh, position of creating Soviets everywhere where conditions were not present. Uh, so, so you see that uh, at every single uh, stage of development of the Cuban uh, revolution, as a matter of fact, the Stalinists were in the wrong side of the argument and in the wrong side of the, of the battle. As I said, in, 1940, in 1942, they joined the Batista government and they had two ministers, uh, Juan Marinello and Carlos, and Carlos uh, Fernandez. And uh, this meant that for many of the revolutionary Cuban youth who wanted to fight against the Batista regime and against imperialism, the two things were very closely linked, uh, the Communist Party was not an attractive uh, proposition. And uh, so you had the rise of the movement around uh, Fidel Castro and his, uh, and his uh, companions who in 1953 launched the assault on the Moncada barracks in an attempt to, to, to act as a spark for a revolutionary uprising that will bring down the dictatorship. Now, th these people, what program did they have? Wh what was the aim of their struggle? The, the program that they had was the classic program of the National Democratic Revolution. You can, you can read it. It's in, uh, it's in a text called History Will Absolve Me, which is uh, Fidel Castro's speech on the, on the dock. And you can see that he says, when we speak uh, of the people in, in relation to the revolutionary struggle, we speak of the workers, the peasants, the poor. Uh, but he also mentions the small uh, businessmen, the petty bourgeois, the, the, the medium-sized uh, entrepreneurs, industrialists, and so on. And when he mentions the aims of the struggle, he, the, the, the main uh, focus of the struggle was the restoration of the, 19, uh, of the 1940 constitution, i.e. democratic rights for everyone. And he had some, some degree of agrarian uh, reform, the national independence, and some measures to improve the lot of the workers, but within the limits of the capitalist system. For instance, the workers should share in the profits of the companies they work for and things like this. Things like this which are now coming back onto the, onto the agenda even in this, in this country, but that's, that's a different matter. Um, so it was clearly a national, and de national democratic program within the limits of capitalism. Now, uh, the, the important question is that on the basis of this program, and the program wasn't so much the most important thing, the, 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 the question was that they launched a revolutionary struggle in, the, in, the, in their case, through uh, means of, uh, of, a, of a an expedition to disembark in Cuba and again provoke a revolutionary spark and a mass, massive insurrection. That didn't, didn't go according to plan. But in a very short space of time, between December uh, 56 and January 59, of which 60 years are coming up uh, this uh, January, uh, they had overthrown the Batista dictatorship. And this you cannot just explain on the basis of the guerrilla war. You have to explain on the basis of the rottenness of the regime they were fighting against and the, and the mass support, the death struggle and sympathy the death struggle uh, created, not only in the countryside, w which was the main base of the, of the guerrilla struggle, where they basically distributed land to the peasants and so on, but also on the, on, in, in the cities where they had large uh, underground networks of support and it is not generally uh, known or highlighted the fact that in, in the end when Batista fled the country on the eve of uh, January 1st, 1959, uh, the guerrillas were still miles away from the capital and the only way that they managed to actually win the revolution and take over uh, uh, the country was through a revolutionary general strike that they declared, particularly in Havana, which lasted for a week before the, any guerrilla troops <coughs> were, were able to enter. So the working class did play a key uh, role, but not an independent role. It only came as, as, uh, at the end of the revolution, and it was not part of the main strategy of the revolutionary uh, movement. But the most interesting thing is what happened between 1959 and 1962. Here's a movement 
which you can describe as a national democratic uh, movement uh, led by uh, petty bourgeois revolutionary youth, which uh, did not have a socialist program, uh, but nevertheless, in the space of three years, they abolished capitalism in Cuba. And this is quite clearly, in, uh, in our opinion, a, a demonstration of the validity of permanent revolution. If they wanted to carry out a genuine agrarian reform, genuine national independence, they had no other alternative than to expropriate capitalism. And on the basis of the expropriation of capitalism is that uh, all the conquests of the Cuban uh, revolution uh, rest. Uh, and now there is a debate in Cuba today uh, about opening up to the market. Uh, basically, uh, se section of the leadership in uh, Cuba, dominant section of the leadership of the revolution in Cuba is thinking along the lines of implementing uh, the Chinese model, let's put it that way, i.e. the slow and gradual restoration of capitalism under the leadership of the same uh, people <coughs> who are uh, currently at the, at the top, the Communist uh, Party. This is very dangerous, it's very dangerous for the conquest of the Cuban uh, revolution because uh, the, the minute capitalist produ productive relations are dominant in Cuba, all the conquest of the revolution will go with it. Uh, free housing uh, for all, free education for all, uh, free health care for all, and all the living, con living conditions and living standards that have been won uh, as a result of the Cuban Revolution will be destroyed if, if uh, capitalism is uh, restored. And that's the way the revolution is going now. But the most important thing is to understand that even though the, Cubans did not, the Cuban uh, li revolutionary leadership did not have a program of abolishing capitalism, they were pushed into that by the objective uh, uh, conditions because they were consequent and consistent in applying their own program, which was a national democratic pro 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 uh, program. And this puts Cuba in contrast with the two other revolutions that we are discussing in the, in the book, with, uh, with uh, Nicaraguan and, um, and the Venezuelan, uh, <coughs> and the Venezuelan uh, uh, revolution. In, uh, in Nicaragua, <coughs> I won't have time to go into any, uh, into any detail, but uh, Nicaragua, as you know, is, is in Central America. Central America is one of the areas in Latin America that's, that's uh, had the most crushing domination of U.S. imperialism. And this started back in the 1820s with the destruction of the attempt to set up a, a united uh, bourgeois republic throughout Central America. Central America was split up into many different in non-viable uh, indep so-called independent countries that were completely under the boot, under the domination of U.S. imperialism, which constant military interventions, military presence for years on end, and brutal dictatorships. This, this is the history of Honduras, Guatemala, uh, Nicaragua, all the countries in the, in the region suffered from, from, from that. Uh, and there have been, El Salvador, and there have been a number of revolutionary uprisings in all these uh, countries. The, the, the struggle of Cesar Augusto Sandino in the 1920s and 30s in uh, Nicaragua, the uprising of Farabundo Martí, who was a communist in 1932 in El Salvador, who was drowned in uh, blood, 10,000 people were massacred, and uh, so on. Nicaragua lived for many decades, from 1937 up until 1979, and the brutal dictatorship of the Somoza family. The Somoza family were not only a bourgeois capitalist uh, family with close links with imperialism, but they basically dominated uh, a large part of the country's economy, maybe 40% of the economy was in their hands, the land, the, the industries, and, and so on. And uh, because of the treacherous role played by the Communist Party, which in, in Nicaragua was, was uh, going under the name of the, of the Socialist Party of Nicaragua. Uh, again, we see a situation where revolutionary youth who want to struggle against this dictatorship are uh, repelled. In fact, many of them came out of the, of the Socialist uh, Party, the Stalinist Party, partly as a result of the influence of the Cuban uh, Revolution, and they set up a new organization uh, uh, named the, the Sandinista Front of National uh, Liberation, which was set up in the, 19, in the 1960s by, Car by Carlos Fonseca, Tomás Borges, and other leaders. Th this uh, organization, this organization carried out uh, again uh, 
a guerrilla struggle which was mostly ineffectual for many uh, years. He was smashed almost any time they uh, reared their head and attempted a new uh, campaign. And uh, progressively the Sandinista Front was split into three different uh, factions. And one of the debates was precisely around this question. Uh, or the main debate, I would say, was around this question of the role of the bourgeois in the anti-Somosa struggle and the attitude that the revolutionaries had to have towards uh, that. Even though there were some people at the beginning who were against that, and Carlos Fonseca himself had a more critical uh, attitude. But uh, in the end, by 1978-79, when the Sandinista Front reunited uh, in one single organization, the stagist tendency had won the debate. And everyone was defending the idea that uh, they had to make an alliance with the progressive uh, bourgeois. And there were some bourgeois who were against uh, Somoza at that uh, time, only they didn't want its revolutionary, his revolutionary overthrow, but they, they had differences with, with him. And that the, the revolution in power should uh, limit itself to national democratic tasks. The socialism was not on the, on the agenda. Uh, the Sandinista revolution takes the name from, from the Sandinista front, but as a matter of fact, most of the uprising took place outside of the, of the FSL, FSLN <coughs> formal structures. Uh, people in uh, cities like uh, Leon, in uh, neighborhoods like Monimbo, and other places like that, they just rose up in a spontaneous uh, uprising led by very young people, most of them secondary school uh, students, and they took the name of the only organization that seemed to be consequent in fighting the dictatorship. But in most cases, the guerrillas arrived uh, only when the, the, the uprising had already taken place. And the 19th of July, 1979, the dictatorship uh, fell and the Sandinistas uh, came to power. But from the very beginning, they, uh, the, the leadership of the Sandinista Front carried out a policy which was uh, to stop any attempt at the revolution going beyond the, the formal limits of the bourgeois, of the bourgeois democratic uh, revolution. They had first a coalition uh, government which uh, collapsed because the bourgeois withdrew from, uh, from it, similar to what had happened in uh, Cuba. But instead of taking advantage of this to move forward and expropriate uh, capitalism, the leaders, particularly Daniel and Umberto Ortega, who were the leaders of the right wing of the, of the Sandinista Front, uh, insisted that uh, no property should be touched and, and carried out the most conservative possible uh, policy in relation to the question of the economy. By, 1980 <coughs> by 1981, as we know, uh, Reagan was, ele was uh, elected president in the United States and immediately launched a campaign against the Sandinista uh, revolution with the full support of the bourgeois in, uh, in uh, Nicaragua. And they launched the Contra War, a campaign of insurgency, uh, a really reactionary uh, gang of uh, cutthroats and, uh, and the worst elements in, in society were recruited into this Contra army, were armed and financed by the CIA and they were, uh, and, and neighboring countries were used as bases for attacking, uh, attacking uh, the Nicaraguan revolution. That is, that is not a surprise. There's a revolution, counter-revolution organizes itself with the support of imperialism. But what was really scandalous in Nicaragua was the fact that while the bourgeois was all on the side of count open counter-revolution, they were still allowed to operate legally in the country. The properties were untouched. And so they could use the mass media, the influence through the Catholic Church, the political uh, parties, and above all, the economic power that they still had to sabotage the actions of the Sandinist uh, government. So the Sandinistas were fighting against counter-revolution with not one, but two arms tied to the back by this uh, theory of respecting bourgeois private uh, property. And they, all the time, the whole policy was to please uh, Scandinavian Social Democracy, the Spanish Socialist Party, tried to prove to them that they were not communists, that they were not socialists, that they were, they, were, they, they were committed to what they called a mixed economy, i.e. an economy that's dominated by the capitalist uh, sector. 
And uh, this led eventually to the defeat of the Nicaraguan uh, uh, revolution, the attempt to make a revolution halfway. And uh, progressively, even some of the conquests of the revolution were being uh, rolled back. By, 19 <coughs> by 1990, there was an election which the Sandinistas uh, lost. Uh, at that time, the economy was in complete collapse. There was hyperinflation, and, uh, and it was a complete disaster. And many people uh, thought, well, if we get rid of the Sandinistas, at least we'll have an economic uh, stability. We'll put an end to, the, to this never-ending war, and so on. I'd like to mention that both the Cubans, the Cuban uh, leadership, and uh, the Russians, the Soviet uh, leadership, advised the Nicaraguan uh, leadership not to follow the same path as the Cuban Revolution. I.e., the Cuban uh, leadership had come to power on the basis of a national democratic program <coughs> and then had abolished capitalism, but they insisted that this is not what should happen in uh, Nicaragua. And they obviously had a lot of political authority. Yes, Humberto and Daniel Ortega were already committed to such a policy, but uh, the advice that they were getting from uh, the Cubans was, do not do like we've uh, done. And it was a completely disastrous advice, which played uh, a, a disastrous role in the defeat of the, of the revolution. And, and the consequences of that we see today in, uh, in Nicaragua, where we have a Sandinist uh, government, which has uh, nothing to do with the conquests of the gains of the revolution, which were genuine gains, gains in, in terms of uh, agrarian reform, although limited, uh, education, healthcare, and so on. The, this is a Sandinist government that has ruled the country for, uh, for two mandates in uh, agreement with uh, COSEP, the, the capitalist uh, confederation, in agreement with the uh, owners of the industries in the Maquiladora sector, with agreement with the hierarchy of the Catholic Church, which came to power on the basis of voting to criminalize uh, abortion, we were discussing abortion rights in, uh, in the previous session, and, and through the book we explain how abortion rights and women's rights in general are, are one, uh, 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 one aspect that allows us to, uh, uh, to see how progressive or in which direction a, re a particular regime is uh, going. And in the case of uh, Nicaragua, uh, abortion to a certain extent, was already legal from the 19th uh, century, but then was criminalized, was illegalized, uh, by the votes of the Sandinist uh, party just before they came to power this last, uh, this last time. They came to power on the basis of an agreement with the Liberal Party, the party of the contrast, the party that had been carried out, carrying out the counter-revolutionary war against the, against the Nicaraguan uh, revolution. And now, finally, we come to the situation in Venezuela. Because the situation in Venezuela uh, has many parallels with the situation in, uh, in Nicaragua. There are also obviously differences. The, the, the Venezuelan revolution came to power through uh, an election 20 years ago. On the 6th of December 1998, uh, it's now uh, nearly 20 years, uh, Chávez was elected for the first time. And he, his election represented uh, uh, entry of the masses onto the scene of politics after a whole series of events that had happened before and the complete discrediting of the previous uh, regime. At the beginning, Chávez also had a program. He even said his program was the third way. During his election campaign in 98, he came to Britain. He went to Oxford, uh, gave a speech, met with Tony Blair, and he said, I like his idea of a third way, something that is not capitalism and not socialism. And uh, basically, his idea was to uh, democratize the political process in uh, Venezuela and, to a certain extent, use the oil wealth uh, for the benefit of the majority of the, of the population. That's a very uh, <coughs> limited uh, program, but a program which, in the conditions of Venezuela, the ruling class will not accept uh, <coughs> that it will be carried out fully. And so in 2002, we saw how the ruling class uh, organized a military uprising, a coup, against this uh, government. A government that was not communist, was not socialist by any stretch of imagination, was just proposing some minor progressive uh, reforms that we fully support. Uh, 
Uh, but just that just demonstrates the reactionary character, the reactionary character of the of the ruling class, the bourgeoisie in these uh, countries. I mean, the, the, the whole of the bourgeois uh, carried out this coup against uh, Chavez. In fact, they were so full of themselves, so confident that when they uh, appointed the new president after the coup in April 2002, they had a meeting in a room a bit bigger than this with 400 people, and they signed an attendance uh, sheet. And uh, in th this attendance list, you can see the who's who of uh, the Venezuelan uh, bourgeoisie. If Chavez had expropriated the properties of the people in that room, and he had ample reason for doing that, Capitalism will have been abolished in, uh, in Venezuela overnight. But he did not do that. And uh, at every single juncture, he attempted to, uh, again, compromise with the bourgeois, appeal to the bourgeois to invest, and, and so on. By 2005, and this is also an interesting point, Chavez changed his line. He said, uh, while he had previously talked about the third way, he now said, the only way to achieve the aims of the Bolivarian Revolution is by abolishing capitalism. And uh, overcoming capitalism can only be done through socialism. Uh, now, we fully agree with that. And that is, again, a demonstration of, of the permanent uh, revolution. The problem is that these words were never fully taken into practice. And Venezuela, all the way up to 2013, when Chavez uh, died, continued to be a capitalist uh, country. And we have to say that this confusion uh, existed within uh, the whole Bolivarian movement, but also within Chavez himself. One day he will be talking about socialism, he will be supporting workers taking over factories, he will be talking about workers' control and encouraging workers to take over the factories, which they did. The next day he will be appealing to the bourgeois to be productive and invest and so on. So there was a lot of confusion in his, uh, in his own political thinking. But I think it's still very significant that he moved from a position of saying no, we, we, we're not socialist, we, we want the third way or whatever, to a position where, sa where he said, um, the leader of a revolutionary movement involving millions of people, he said the only way forward is socialism. Uh, and that really opened the debate in Venezuela and beyond about that uh, question. By the time Chavez uh, died in 2013, in his last election, he, he made a speech called uh, Turn the Rada, Golpe de Timon, and in this speech he basically expressed his frustration at the lack of progress of the revolution, and he said there, there's two things that will not been solved. One, the, the economy is still a capitalist economy, and, uh, the, um, and the state is still a bourgeois state. The economy must become a socialist economy, and the state, the bourgeois state must be pulverized. We must create, create a worker state based on the, on the communes, which at that time were starting to be created. But nothing of that was then carried out into practice. And Maduro, if anything, when he was elected in 2013, turned further to the right, further towards compromise with the capitalists. And the capitalists were in no mood to compromise. They were sabotaging the economy. But above all, the attempt to combine elements of uh, state control and regulation of the economy uh, without creating a, a, a nationalized and planned economy, completely disrupted the Venezuelan economy, and that is the reason for the current economic crisis. Now, the bourgeois are all shouting, oh, the situation in Venezuela is terrible. Yes, the situation in Venezuela is terrible. This is one of the worst economic crises in recent uh, history. 40% of GDP has been uh, knocked out. Uh, there is hyperinflation. Uh, I mean, I don't know, the IMF says the inflation will reach 1 million percent this year. I, I think that's, that's probably an exaggeration, but it's not far from the, from the truth. And the living conditions of the masses are collapsed. But that's not the result of socialism, because there's no socialism in Venezuela. That's precisely the result of the failure to nationalize the economy and plan the economy under a democratic plan of the, of, of, of the economy with the participation of the workers. So, um, obviously, I, 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 I don't have the time to go into detail into each one of these countries, but you can see that the, the, the common, that there are maybe one or two common threads in these three revolutions that we want to bring out in this uh, book. Because this book is not just about history, it's about revolutionary strategy for Latin America today. And these main threads are, one, there can be no genuine advance, even on national, democratic, anti-imperialist demands, 
of agrarian reform, which still has to be carried in many countries, of genuine liberation from imperialism and so on, without the abolition of capitalism and without the workers really taking uh, power. And number two, this requires, this requires a revolutionary leadership uh, equipped with a Marxist program. This cannot be uh, improvised. And in all of these three cases, including in the case of Cuba, where the revolution then uh, acquired a number of bureaucratic features, came under the influence of the Soviet uh, Union, and there was never a genuine regime of workers' uh, democracy. Uh, a, a revolutionary leadership equipped with a clear Marxist uh, program is required for the revolution to be uh, successful and to, uh, and to follow uh, the correct, uh, the correct uh, path. And without that, uh, the road to hell is paved with good uh, intentions. We, we're not here judging whether Chavez wa was honest in his uh, speeches. The problem is that his uh, shortcomings in carrying out even what he was talking uh, about uh, has led to the disaster uh, now. And, and, and this is a lesson for all of these uh, revolutions. The, the case of uh, Nicaragua is particularly, is particularly uh, striking situation where, where you have now an extremely repressive regime. Uh, 200 or more people have been killed in protest since, since uh, April uh, in alliance with the bourgeois and the most reactionary elements of the Catholic Church and so on. And this regime still calls itself Sandinista, he claims the legacy of the Sandinista revolution, which had nothing to do with, uh, with this. And in Venezuela, we're moving very, cl very rapidly to a situation like that, where, where there's a regime that calls itself Bolivarian, but has nothing to do with the revolutionary traditions, as, as, as uh, smashed workers' control, uh, is compromising with, uh, with the bourgeois, is opening up the country for foreign multinational investment, only this time not from the US, but from China, Russia, and other countries, Iran, Turkey and it's a complete uh, disaster. So therefore, studying uh, theory and studying the, exper studying the experience of previous uh, revolutions is absolutely uh, required, is, a, is an absolute requirement for preparing the forces for the new revolutionary events that are gonna take uh, place, uh, end up in a victory for our class in one country or another, which will then open the floodgates throughout Latin America and will have uh, an impact beyond the, the continent.